Good morning, and welcome to the First Existentialist Congregation of Atlanta. We are a philosophically based spiritual community founded on existential philosophy and feminist principles and dedicated to human liberation and the protection of the natural world. My name is Patton White, and I will be facilitating this morning's celebration of life. <clears throat> Excuse me. We make our spiritual home in the old stone church which was hand-built 100 years ago by the African-American Antioch East Baptist Church. We honor their labors of love and the powerful history of this special place. We acknowledge that our spiritual home stands on land forcibly taken from the Muscogee Creek people. We support justice and equality for all indigenous people. Our opening words were selected by today's speaker, uh, and uh, <clears throat> he sent me this quote by Barbara Brown Taylor uh, and asked if I would share this as our opening words. The last 16 months have been hell for a lot of people. I know some who took their sick relatives to the emergency room and never saw them alive again. I know small business owners who kept everyone on payroll and watched their savings run through their fingers like rain. I know two people who killed themselves because they ran out of hope. That makes it hard to talk about the gifts of the pandemic, which stole a lot of things from a lot of people. Every time I try, it feels like being unfaithful to them. But if I don't do that, if I don't name the gifts of the past 16 months along with the thefts, then that feels like unfaithfulness to the wholeness that is always at work on my own wholeness, inviting me to the marriage of opposites and startling me with their chemistry. Why do I feel more noble when I lament than when I rejoice? Why is it so difficult to admit whole truths, not partial ones, into the mixed company of our own hearts? And again, this is a quote by Barbara Brown Taylor. This morning we have some special music provided by a, a friend and associate of Re Franklin Abbott. And this is music by Ben Rosenblum. Please enjoy this upcoming musical selection. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ben. That was so lovely in so many different ways. Today's speaker is Franklin Abbott. Franklin Abbott is sheltering with two felines in Midway Woods, a suburb of Decatur. He continues to see clients for psychotherapy and to write poetry. He will be in a writing retreat at the Lillian E. Smith Center in Clayton on the Sunday of this talk and will miss Zooming with the congregation. Please join me in welcoming Franklin Abbott. Good morning. I'm Franklin Abbott, and I am at my home in Midway Woods, which is midway between Decatur and Avondale, part of the greater Atlanta area, and I'm happy to be sharing thoughts and poetry with the, the friends and congregation of the First Existentialist Congregation of Atlanta. Uh, the topic for my talk today uh, is you are always in the middle of your life. And there, this great pause that we've been a part of as a, as a consequence of going through the uh, COVID pandemic, it's slowed us all down. It's given us much time for reflection. And one of the things that I've been reflecting on, you know, is where I am. Uh, and to say that you, I am always in the middle of my life um, is to think about things in a slightly different way. We think about life in stages. You know, you're young or you're old. We think about the middle of life as midlife. Um, and yet, in an existential sense, we're always in the middle of our lives. We are always, you know, in that place where the past has just yielded to the present and has moved into the future. So right here, right now, we are in the middle of our lives and we are experiencing a heightened level, most of us at least, of anxiety uh, and challenge that comes out of at least three places. Uh, our own life challenges, each of us has those. Uh, each of us has things that we worry about that uh, whether they are you know, physically related, uh, relational, uh, something to do with work and making our way in the world. We all have our challenges. We are all dealing with the interface of, of the COVID virus and in different places with that. Uh, you know, the, the most recent sort of three steps back that we've all had to do as a consequence of the Delta variant and the waning of the efficacy of our uh, initial vaccine, you know, has had an impact on us and we're having to figure things out again. Uh, the other thing is, is that we live in a world that is beyond our control and often beyond our comprehension. So every day we make choices that involve self-care, how to stay safe in the pandemic and how to cope with the overwhelming tragedies that come before us. Part of how I cope as a writer is to write. Uh, a dancer might dance, a chef might cook. I can go for a walk, get lost in a book, talk with a friend. There are infinite ways to cope. Remembering I am in the middle of my life is important. In this existential space, I am never too young or too old never too soon or too late. I am right here, right now. My choices arise from this moment. Uh, one of the interesting aspects of the pandemic is paying attention 
uh, to what we might not have noticed before. Uh, noting things that, that might have just been, you know, moving too quickly. When life was moving so quickly, you know, and there were multiple things that happened every day, um, you know, we probably paid less attention. And now we're in a situation where, you know, a few things happen and we pay attention to those few things. And if there's a gift in that, uh, you know, it is that we are really in the middle of our lives, paying attention, being here and now. Um, so I'd like to share some of the things that I've written over the last 18 months with you uh, that have to do with me being in the middle of my life, paying attention to things that might have floated by me otherwise. Um, the first poem that I'd like to read is about pollen. And we always have a marvelous pollen season in Atlanta during the spring. <clears throat> We're, you know, I've noticed recently that the pollen is back uh, for its fall performance. And uh, this is a poem about it. It's called, How Is It Such Beauty Brings So Much Pain? Mowing around wildflowers, I have leerleaf sage pushing up blue-purple blooms, and lots of fleabane, little daisies with delicate white petals and yellow centers to attract all the bees and butterflies. The grass had grown deep, and I was reluctant to cut it with all the dandelions and violets, a million little lavender blooms, but it was on the verge. I pushed my electric mower out of the garage, fiddled with it until it started, and ran it until the battery died, and tomorrow I will finish. Cut the backyard paths and patches and leave prairies for wild things that come and go. The pollen I stirred up was more than my body could handle. I ache. That is what my body does with pollen. I ache. And when I do, lament. I know it is just physical, but I cannot draw the boundary. I lament that I ache, and I ache my lamentation. Were it a song to heaven, I would sing to the gods in a raspy voice. How is it such beauty brings so much pain? How is it such beauty brings so much pain? How is it such beauty brings so much pain? One of the things that I have experienced on a regular basis, and I would, I'm guessing I share this with lots of folks, is exasperation. Just getting to that place where, you know, I am, you know, kind of at my wits end. I don't know exactly what to do or how to take care of things or what choice to make. And so uh, this little poem is about that. It's called The Next Breath. I'm turning my life over to God. I'm giving him, her, them, the keys to my car. I am trusting that the thunderstorms of my destiny are what come before the rainbows. I don't have an image or creed or idol to bow before or behave before, but I put my best foot forward. I push my toes down into the ground and raise my hands to heaven. I believe in the resonance between my goodwill and grace, and I absolve myself of sin in every trace. My history informs my destiny, and it is crooked and craggy and locked in mystery. I can only take the next breath. I can only take the next breath. I can only, only, only take the next breath. I wrote this next piece about a year ago, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, they, they say that a, an artist can uh, foretell the future. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, but um, this does seem an odd poem to read now, uh, given recent events. Um, and it's, it's about a person who comes into my life like three times a year 
and I have a fairly intense interaction with him. Um, he's an independent exterminator, and um, he has helped me through some, you know, problems with pests. Uh, he's he's really quite a a cool guy, but he he's comes from a very different background um, than I do, and he's always got stories to tell. This is called Mike the Bug Man, also known as Michael Hamilton, is six feet tall and always in a light blue cap. He is an independent exterminator, a Vietnam vet, and 79 on his last birthday. Mike is one of my favorite people, not only because he sets traps for rats with peanut butter in my attic and garage and dust for roaches and sprays around my house sending a signal to spiders. Mike has a story and he is telling me about his life, one of 13 children. He consoles me on the death of my mother and we do the math. His mother died at 63. He says he hated his father. His father beat his mother, impregnated her and beat her and Mike said when he became a Christian, he had to repent. He had to let go of his hatred. He said it was time to bring our troops home from Afghanistan. He said it was so awful there. He said we have to take care of our own. And I, with my soft hands and remote compassion, think of the fall of Saigon and wonder who will protect the women and children and the queer folk when the hateful Taliban overrun Kabul and Kandahar? Will there be tent cities in the backyards of Bush, Cheney, and the Clintons? Will Barack and Michelle be serving soup in my garden? Will those who flee medieval morality be given a space to raise bees and corn and tomatoes and sleep at night and sleep at night and sleep at night? Free of fear, free of fear. This is a, a poem about little pleasures revisited after a long time. And of course, one of the, you know, dilemmas that we're in now is that there was that kind of those halcyon days where most of us had gotten vaccinated and we were beginning to be able to socialize with other vaccinated people and, you know, go out and have dinner inside of a restaurant. And this one is uh, about one of those experiences uh, for the soft ride home. A banner in front of the Golden Buddha, inside dining open, we miss you. Chinese food comforts me and I want sizzling rice soup that sounds like Rice Krispies when the hot rice hits the salty soup. I want Mongolian beef, never good as, that, as takeaway. And my friend wants noodles and asks me, with what? Shrimp, I say. I want shrimp lo mein. So our mask waiter brings us our soup and the rice sizzles and we exclaim in glee. Then the sweet and salty beef and the green onions on crispy rice noodles and the shrimp peeking through the mound of lo mein and we eat and sigh and eat and sigh. The tables are distanced. No one sits beside or behind us. I even eat my fortune cookie with its silly message and numbers for the lottery. I don't want the leftovers. Take them to your brother, I tell my friend. I am sated. It was like a dream from before the war when it was safe to drive for comfort food and eat in peace, no rush, just one bite of this and one bite of that and enough left over to perfume the car for the soft ride home. That was May. What is next is best. The needles of the acupuncturist relax my feet, though they burn them first. I can feel the streaks of lightning and the bones rearranging. My acupuncturist says we die from the feet up, so I want my feet to be happy, for my toes to spread, for my, the arch of my arches to rise, for my 
heel to press deep into the moss and peat. I want soup after the needles come out, and order pho pronounced fa, and am happy for the broth and noodles, peppers and mint, everything that swirls below the surface in the depths of the bowl. I drive home, go to my garden, and cut dozens of zinnias I arrange in little vases. I make the two beds I like in the quiet of one of them. Oddly, the cats let me be, enjoying the porch and the drizzle. What can I do but get up and fold the laundry that has been drying, eat my bowl of rice, return phone calls, and when I cannot utter another word or watch another moment of reality, I turn everything off but the keyboard where I am typing myself this message. Worry not, little chief, your cats have given you signals. If the world is out of balance, they will speak into your ears. Worry not, little child, there are always places of displacement. There will always be gypsies knocking at your door. There will always be need for bread and more. There is soup in the kitchen and firewood in the bin. There is water in the kettle and the pantry is full. The horses have been fed and the chickens are roosting. The cabbages clamor and the moon is rising. The zinnias you planted are blooming in profusion. So celebrate life's escalations. And yes, there is cannon fire and storms on the horizon. And yes, there is clamor in the cities and calls for retribution. Quiet yourself. Watch how the cats both inspect and curl to rest. They know what is next is best. This is a poem about fragility. Um, one of the things that I have been uh, paying attention to and being with uh, as part of things being very, very different in the world is that I have a, an elderly father who is 94. And uh, as I mentioned, my mother died last summer. And so my dad is alone. Um, he lives about a mile from my brother and sister-in-law in Nashville, and uh, he has a caregiver. But the caregiver needed a, a vacation, and my brother and sister-in-law needed a break. And so I was, uh, you know, it was my assignment to be with my dad for about 10 days. Um, and this is about dealing with his fragility. And I think that all of us are in a place where we are dealing with fragility. He did not fall. I felt like I was holding something fragile, precious, liquid, flammable. Each step had to be deliberate, each toe in place. The arch and energy of each foot aligned with bone and tendon, the sway of my hips, the point of balance, Three fingers below the navel, all pivot perfect. I had on white gloves, not real ones, but my hands were clean and my fingers nimble as I sorted through old photographs, little cards from a wedding long past, a yellowed will and an old death certificate. When all were sorted into saved and unsaved, my father, who was standing above, looking down, hands clutching his walker, grew tearful, catching each breath, a net for his tears. He said he hadn't been ready to say farewell, this time last year when my mother died. Nancy, my brother's wife, said, we all miss Mimi. My brother told him it was okay. And I held this fragile swan made of air and fire and water, and it did not shatter. Every night of my visit, I slept in the bed my mother died in, on the side of the bed where she lay, where she breathed her last breath. I could hear my father up and down all night. He can't evacuate his bladder. He can't ever have rest. I hear the flush, and again the flush. 
In the morning, I am up, and he is reading the paper, drinking his coffee, doing Sudoku, and I am far from rested, alert to his breath and movements. It is as if I can't divert attention, lest he slip. I can only use half of me, lest he fall. I make it through my tour of duty, careful to a tremble when I pack the car and tell him I love him. I mean it. He echoes back and stands to watch me leave. Hours later, after I call him and tell him I have driven the five hours from Nashville to Atlanta, he falls. He hurts himself, tears flesh, but does not break bone. My brother comes and takes him for emergency care, texts me pictures of his wounds. This morning, I call my father. He answers, says, yes, he fell. One foot went back before it should, and that he is okay. If there was a God I believed in, I would pray, oh, heavenly father, destiny is anything that happened 10 minutes ago. Anything that happened 10 minutes ago is God's will. I don't know what God will do or what he, she, they won't, but I know for 10 days I balanced fate in my hands. I did not falter. I did not stumble. I did not drop. He did not fall. Two more. This is called gardening. Mountain mint and elderberries, Rupert told me they were barriers against invasives, something every gardener has to consider. My garden has been rain doused for almost a dozen days. The leaves are greener and the blossoms fewer. So far, no branch has fallen, and I am not holding my breath. My fraternity of trees, my sorority of birds, my complexity of branch and flight and frog song make a canopy for me and the cats and the squirrels. We are on higher ground, not worried about floods. The frogs seem bolstered, and tonight's concert will be more aria than ballad. And the cats and I will sleep, they on their porch, and me on my little bed, and the squirrels in their nest, and tomorrow will wake us up as always, even though the sun makes no noise when she cracks the dawn like an egg. And back to sort of our current events. You bless our future. Refugee, how to flee. First question how deep is the sea? How wide is the land? Can we withstand? Second question, floating in uncertainty, will I be allowed or returned? Third question, should I relent or persist? If I am where I have chosen to be, if I have fled my homeland, if I have taken my children and elders on a long march, from home to the sea, and if we have been given life jackets, more life expectancy than we had, and we were hungry and thirsty and holding on to each other, and we know a sister was about to give birth, and then they stole the motor from our boat and pushed us back with their oars, and we languished in the unforgiving sea. We did not stop loving each other. We gave each other breath. How many days did we love each other into life? How did we learn that famished hands, exhausted hands, old hands, children's hands, hold, 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 and we held on? For us and for you who were born now here anew, we knew you were coming. We knew we were bringing you to peace and plenty. You bless our future, our future. You bless our future.
Thank you so much, Franklin, for sharing as usual. Please join us on Zoom immediately following today's broadcast for our meet and greet where we will discuss the topics brought up by our speaker today, as well as sharing personal joys, sorrows, and concerns, and any community announcements that people have to share. You can find the link to uh, reach that Zoom meeting in the chat section of today's broadcast. Next week, we will have our annual Founders Day celebration, uh, another special um, recognition of this organization's founding. And uh, so please plan on staying around just a little bit longer than we may normally uh, have been uh, staying for our Zooms and prepare yourselves with a snack or a beverage nearby so that we can shift into a social period as if we are having one of our famous in-person potluck gatherings. And also, please consider channeling your inner Lanier and wearing your glam rock Lanier finery. Uh, if you have one of the special hand-painted um, scarves that he did, I plan on wearing that, or just something sparkly and very festive, as Lanier always was. We hope that you have a great rest of your day today, your weekend, and the coming week ahead, and we look forward to seeing you the next time. Take care. Bye-bye.